insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights <laughs> into Entertainment. This is episode 66. We hope. <laughs> it's all fake anyway. Right. Uh, I am your host, Joseph Whalen, and my genuine and informed co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. <laughs> How are you doing today, dear? I'm good. How are you? Um, frazzled because of all the technical <laughs> issues we've been running into today. We had a, a bit of a... Network issue overnight, right. which caused the IP address on the streaming machine to change, which broke my ability to stream. Um, wah, 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 wah. All kinds of problems. Yeah. But we're here now. We hope. We we <laughs> we are. I'm watching us live, okay. so we're good. Hi. Um, so we have a podcast <coughs> today. Okay. So in our Disney Detective, we will look at some of the steps that Disney World will be doing. Uh, for their partial reopening. Uh, then we will look at uh, Disney's Frozen not returning to Broadway. And then in our Star Wars Insights, we have a Lucasfilm exec who uh, thinks the franchise is fake. <gasps> hmm. Wonder how well that went over. <laughs> in our entertainment news... Grease apparently is the word. Mm. We'll hear more about that. Then a film version of Hamilton will be streaming available on Disney Plus, which I know you've been uh, very eager to see mm -hmm. Hamilton. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully <coughs> that will get us uh, the satisfaction you're looking for from Hamilton. Then, mm -hmm. then we will uh, finish up with our. Insightful picks of the week and spoiler, my pick is not a documentary a second week in a row. <gasps> Don't worry, I'll be back on a documentary <laughs> pick next week. He already knows what it is for next yeah, week. So we're good. So anyway, uh interesting show today. You ready to get started? Sure. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So obviously Disney world is and disneyland are trying to figure out what steps they need to reopen phase one of the reopening is actually just disney springs disney springs is the shopping entertainment food section of the walt disney world uh resort so hang on a second there so disney springs itself it, the property is owned by Disney, mm -hmm. but all the businesses aren't. Is that correct? That is correct. So there are third-party companies that are there. Uh, some of the shops that are uh, there are third-party. Some of the most of the restaurants are third-party. So this phase of what is opening next week on May twentieth is actually all of the subcontracting shops so none of the disney owned shops or eateries are actually opening yet. so your world of disney your world of disney is not toy store is right. not opening okay right it's it's basically all of the other shops and all of the other restaurants that'll be opening up um and again that's may 20th they're supposed to be opening up so just a few you know a few days um the good news is that 117 custodians are going back to work along with the other uh employees that help to to run the area um, you know, the president of the local 362 union basically said, you know, it was a mixed bag of emotions. Everybody's kind of excited to, to go back to work, but there's that potential for infection, sure. but also they need to pay their rent. 
you know, um, Florida, you know, if you see different stories about unemployment, um, their system hasn't been working out too well, especially for the people that are in the theme park industry. So a lot of people haven't been getting any money at all during this time. Obviously, Disney stepped up and, you know, we saw, you know, um, certain employees were getting paid for a, a yeah, period amount of time. Yeah, Disney kind of went out of its way to try and, and take care of its employees right. knowing, you know, one, it was tough times and two, right. that the state was having issues. Right. So I'm sure there's a lot of the, you know, the cast members that are looking to, to get back. So again, May 20th, only the sub crack, subcontracted shops will be opening. Um, the next phase will start seven days later when Disney retailers such as the World of Disney, Disney eateries will open, and an additional 59 custodians will report back to work on May 24th. So slowly, you know, starting to, to see how it how it is. Um, all guests and employees are going to be required to wear masks. Disney will actually provide employees with three washable masks, and guests will have to have their temperatures checked um, when they get there. Um, for those that don't know, they have um, parking garages with entrances, so it's not like you... They kind of corral There's you. Central areas where you have access to downtown right. Disney. Right. So it's online. not like you just park and you know multiple places can can get in. Yeah. There's controlled so entrances. It's, it's definitely controlled. So they'll be, and I'm sure they'll probably have certain areas closed off, one to limit the amount of people that are able to to go, and also so that people can you know get checked out. So guess we'll. Um, have to swipe their own credit cards for payment. Cast members will be behind plexiglass, as well as obviously wearing the face masks. Um, custodians are actually going to be going around and making sure, you know, to be clean. You, you'll see a lot more custodial staff there than probably normal because people are going to, you know, they're going to be constantly cleaning different um you know areas the one thing that i thought was interesting was that no disciplinary action will occur if an employee misses work due to a possible illness that's a big deal because a lot of times you know you'll hear somebody you know i called out of work and they get in trouble or you know they get written up or they get fired here at least they're taking it serious that if you are out for illness you're not going to lose your job because of it. And it did also say that any park employee who uh, does unfortunately get the virus will be paid up to two weeks to quarantine. So that that's a, a nice step yeah. to, to hear about um, as well. So no word when Anaheim will be opening up. So this is probably more of a test to kind of see and kind of gauge how it's going to be. Um, what was interesting was that NBC Universal this past Tuesday announced that Universal Studios Orlando would partially open this week. And they kind of did the same thing. They're not opening the park, but they opened up City Walk, which is Universal's version of Disney Springs. They actually opened up a portion of it on Thursday, and just select venues were opened. They were uh, they're only open from four to ten. What's kind of funny though is, and I saw a couple of people because I have a lot of Disney friends that I personally know as well as you know through the the world of, of Facebook, and there were a couple of them that were doing live Facebook lives of you know coming back. And everybody kind of joked and said it looked like the only people that were there were the blog, the vloggers. <laughs> nobody else, <Yeah. laughs> nobody else was there. Ba you know, basically everybody that was there was there to to video. Um, the one video that I happened to catch talked about they they were a, a vlogger that knew somebody else for years and years, never got to meet them. Finally, they were in City Walk at the same time. And this was a weird situation because they couldn't shake each other's hand or give each other a hug, right. but yet they'd known each other, you know, for so many years virtually. And now it's like, hey, 
You stay your six feet away. Yeah. I'll stay. I'll so stay Disney, mine. So Disney Springs typically has a um, cast member presence down there. Mm -hmm. They have a customer service area. They've mm -hmm. got um, vacation club is down there. Mm -hmm. So is that presence not going to be it there right off the bat? It doesn't sound like it. At least... So stroller rentals and stuff like that won't be available in this first yeah. week. Yeah, and you you have to figure too. The only people that are are going are going to be locals. Anybody that's in the area, it's not like you're gonna. Hey, let's run down to to Disney now. Um, well, I don't know. Given all the people that have flocked to the beaches in Jersey, well, and, that's and true California, too. you know. Well, it's a we, really long drive for us to go just to. Yeah, we don't weekend down there. That's <laughs> we for don't sure. Weekend. No, not until we get that private plane. Right, right, and and I I guess if it's something where you're local, you're a huge Disney fan, just to maybe even just sit, not even necessarily do any shopping, just to kind of be feel a little normal maybe you know maybe this is if that. disney is ever normal sure well for some people it is you know yeah. if we lived close enough i could totally see us just like hey let's go for an hour and see if we lived close enough i probably would have jumped off the bridge a long time ago <laughs> from the top of the parking uh, yeah. garage <laughs> yeah. so. so we'll see we'll see how how well it does you know no word how city walk has and been I, doing. And you know what? I think this is sort of the approach that the whole country's taking. Mm -hmm. It's we have to get back to work. Let's try to do it smartly. Let's do a little bit right. of experimentation. Mm -hmm. Let's see where we go because everyone's a little gun shy at this point. Right. You know, you don't want to open up full boat and then have another relapse right. of the. Infection. And the other thing too is how are the are the restaurants only going to be takeout? Or well, and that's sort of what the plan is for New York and New Jersey is the right. restaurants will open. If you have outdoor seating, they encourage that. Right. And they are encouraging 50% capacity and people are rearranging their tables to get Right. That and that we, we kind of knew in, you know, the, the previous week they had talked right. about, you know, when you do open up. Your tables are going to have to be so far apart from from anything inside and, the actual. You know, one of the other uh, announcements, or not announcements, but uh, there was a news article that came out saying that dine in, uh, 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 eat in dining is probably going to be all reservation based for mm -hmm. quite some time I now could, because of how selective I could see it's that. Be. I could definitely see that. This way, you don't just show up. Yeah. And. Plus, then you don't have people waiting outside. Right. Milling about outside or at the bar or something right. like that. Right. You go in, you t have your seat, and you, you yeah. know, I, I could see it's, that. The problem is, is it's going to kill restaurants still. Because oh, yeah, because they're not the going to be a capacity. You figure the restaurants right now are sort of surviving on takeout. So you mm -hmm. have an absolute minimal staff of people preparing food right. and giving it out to people who are driving up. Mm hmm when you go into the point where you're running at this diminished capacity with seating, you have to onload more staff. Mm -hmm. And the problem you're going to run into is you can't have the amount of foot traffic coming in right, to that you need to be profitable for, for that additional right. staff that you need. Yeah. Unless, you know, when you go to make that reservation and you can't make a reservation, it gives you 10% off a takeout order. True. Uh, you know, you could, I mean, I mean that's you know, certainly another well, way maybe. to do it, but the problem know. is you start discounting the stuff that you have very tight margins on. Right. You're not making profit on that right. either. So. Or, or maybe if you can't get the reservation, are you still willing to get, you know, takeout? I yeah. don't know. Well, and I think a lot of these restaurants are kind of hoping that this ramp up period is very brief mm -hmm. and very effective mm -hmm. um, because they're not going to be able to survive forcing themselves to 50%. So what you're going to see is a lot of people violating those rules mm -hmm. and you're not going to have enough health inspectors going around right. finding those violations. So mm -hmm. you're going to expose more people to danger. Right. I'm, I'm more than content at this point getting takeout. I, I think we will probably be one of the later ones to go back mm -hmm. to a normal state of being. Yeah. Uh, at this point in time, given all the stuff that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> So tell us about Frozen. So this was 
kind of sad to to hear. Um, so Disney's Frozen on Broadway, um, they made the announcement that it will not reopen once the rest of Broadway uh opens so the cast was actually notified on thursday that the musical would not be returning to new york st james theater due to industry-wide shutdown and result uh resulting in economic fallout um this is obviously not surprising in some respects but in others um unfortunately they had made an announcement that Broadway was actually going to uh, still be shut down until September 6th. So I guess when the original uh, news came out about Broadway shutting down, they were hoping that at least by midsummer they could possibly open back up. But it was the Broadway League had actually issued the statement extending uh, the closure of the 41 theaters in New York through September 6th. So that's you know, three months beyond the original um, extension. So with all of that, obviously, Disney kind of looked at, okay, this is how many shows we have on Broadway. And Frozen being the newest of the bunch was the least profitable. So it was really more of a financial thing than anything else. Um, So... You still have, you know, The Lion King, you still have Aladdin, even though they've been on Broadway for, you know, a lot longer, they were still doing much better um, than Frozen. So it was basically just their decision, you know, financially to to do that. Um, But the one thing, though, is that there are national tours that are still going to be showing uh Frozen. So there were actually international tours, uh, London, Germany, Tokyo, and Australia through the end of 2021, they were going to have, uh, troops, uh, showing it. So the show still is going to be performed, just not coming back to Broadway. So the show must go on. It just doesn't necessarily have to go on on Broadway. (laughs) Right, exactly. And more than likely, this will not be the only show that doesn't return um there there were talks that excuse me there were some other productions that were supposed to start sometime this summer and now have been pushed to march of 2021 for their start date so i'm sure uh you know this isn't the last that we've heard i actually ended up seeing this morning on on the today show they were talking about this And they were saying they were interviewing um, one of the actors and he basically said, as things start to open back up, live entertainment is probably going to be the last thing that, you know, comes back. And we kind of, you know, knew that we had talked about this, you know, just in general. We have uh, we had two concerts planned for the summer. Um, One was in i guess it was july was supposed to be july one's july one's august the one for july has already been canceled we've already gotten notified shows canceled we're just waiting on our refund i have a feeling that the one that's for the end of august is probably going to be canceled you know as well they're just waiting on that so while it's nice that they're doing all these virtual things like the virtual comic cons and 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 things like that it is sad to see you know that the live stuff we don't have a date for you know we have no idea when yeah. well, all of that's going to come of it, back a lot of it is the uncertainty the mm-hmm. fear yeah. uh, the fact that we don't have uh, uh, a vaccine at this mm-hmm. point in time. Right, right. And you probably aren't going to see these things pick up until right. some of these early adoption, you know, phase one type mm-hmm. things uh, start to show positive results. Right. Um, you know, we talked about the fact that people just need to have some level of confidence mm-hmm. before they're going to expose themselves to oh, that kind of risk. Absolutely. And what we're seeing, you know, with the, the gradual openings and stuff like that are, you know, they're designed to instill that confidence Mm -hmm. in you over time. Right. I only hope that that confidence 
proves out and mm -hmm. we don't have recurring problems. Yeah. So, but that was all we had for Disney Detective. We'll mm -hmm. be back in a minute with our Star Wars Insights. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Star Wars Insights. See, I waited. So, it seems that a Lucasfilm executive is feeling the heat after calling Star Wars fake on social media. Oh, my goodness. <gasps> Doesn't he know? <laughs> How damn he. <laughs> so, the triggered moment occurred last Saturday while Matt Martin, the story group creative executive for the Disney-owned franchise, was answering a Twitter thread about whether non-Disney sanctioned spinoffs could be regarded as canon. So he kind of, con you know, concluded that fans could accept whatever version they wanted as gospel, but couldn't hold new creators accountable for not following suit. In 2014, Lucasfilms announced that it would be moving all of their elements of the expanded universe of Star Wars, such as video games, fan fiction, comics, and movies, from the official film um, myth moving forward, which this is something that you can obviously, you know, talk to, which you've kind of gone on and on about before, how pissed you were that it wasn't, you know, that they basically said, nope, none of that ever happened. Right. Correct? So he kind of, you know, blurted in a tweet, well, it's all fake anyway, so you can choose to accept whatever you want as part of the story. Yeah, that went over well. <laughs> that went over so well <laughs> that there were... Twitter fights all over the place. I'm I'm surprised you didn't like join in. I try to troll <laughs> less and less on Twitter these yeah, days. Yeah, that that's true. So, you know, basically and then, you know, there was somebody that fumed and was like, "Nothing is fake." You know, nothing in Star Wars is fake. Like, okay. So, it, just for the record, okay. Star Wars is fictional. I get that. I don't pretend that it's real. <laughs> right, right. Um, even before Disney got involved, uh, you had what was called the Expanded Universe. Mm -hmm. And the Expanded Universe was made up mostly of novels and video games right. and board games and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you had this jumbled mess of inconsistent stories. You had official novels right. that were endorsed by Lucasfilm. And those novels oftentimes conflicted with these other sources. So it was kind of a mess. And I could understand Disney's point in wanting to have authority over what the canonical story is. And maybe stream it, you know. Absolutely. So this is how. The it... way they did it was questionable. Because right. instead of taking what was out there and picking and choosing, I think, being the history guy that I am, the Council of Nicaea. Where all the bishops gathered around, they picked up all these books of gospel, and they, mm -hmm. they handpicked the ones that they were going to make the Bible. And Disney had an opportunity to build their Bible. And instead, what they did was they came in, and instead of picking and choosing the various pieces they were going to build the foundation on, 
they just sledgehammered the whole thing and said none of that stuff existed. Right. And now they're coming back in and finding that there were very good pieces of storytelling that were in there that they're now cherry picking mm -hmm. to put in and they're modifying them. Right. You know, they're changing what, what the original stories were. And all of that's well and good. They're gonna they're gonna shepherd this into a a, a coherent storyline moving forward. Um, until they, you know, handed it off to Ryan Johnson and let him screw the whole thing up. <laughs> but for this guy to be taking heat for saying that it's it's all fake and you can believe whatever you want. Right, right. Well, that's perfectly fine, but that's really not what you want your executives executive saying about right. your franchise. Right. It's like, that's just common sense. Right, and, and like I said, just hearing what these fans are saying it's like yet another sign that lucasfilm is in its current incarnation sees profit as top priority storytelling be damned and you know nothing in star wars is fake it's the creative product of hundreds sometimes thousands of people and it deserves to be treated with respect not dismissed as fake respect your work dude <laughs> Well, and, and you know what? A, a, there's a part of me that can understand where that anger is mm -hmm. coming from. Oh, yeah. And it's not Disney that's doing this. No. Because if you look and watch what my insightful pick will be next week, um, there is that passion. There mm -hmm. is that guidance. Yes. There is that support from yes. Disney for mm -hmm. the franchise. Yeah. So it's not Disney as a whole that's doing this. Right. You have one rogue, disgruntled employee who's an executive that handles the product mm -hmm. that probably shouldn't be doing it anymore because he doesn't have the passion needed right. in order to support the product. And I think that's what, not to, to go on to what your insightful pick is you know, for next week, but that was something where you could see the love. Yes. It, it's a love story. Yeah. You know, there's that, you see the little 10-year-old kid who's been in love with this. The, the people you know. that are shepherding the franchise are the same people mm -hmm. that loved it as kids like mm -hmm. I did. Right. It wasn't, it's not a job to them. Right, right. And that's Seeing where. that makes me feel good about the direction mm -hmm. of the franchise. Yeah. Seeing this tells me that this was probably an executive, and I don't know this guy's background or what his, his uh, resume looks like. Right, right. But this guy's not a Star, Star Wars fan. right. And he's probably just some other executive that came up the ranks, got thrown into this position, and, right. and doesn't have a clue. Right, and probably just commented because people were whatever, and he was just like, you know what, it's fake anyway. And probably just kind of meant it maybe more off the cuff. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> and you have that's people, probably what I want. And it is. You know? I'm like, it's fiction, people. It is <laughs> fake. I, you know, I know everyone wants to believe it, but... It's it was it made up a large poor right. part of the formative years of people my age. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a part of our heritage. Right. But it's fake. It's still <laughs> fake. Get off the guy's back. Disney right. He needs to wise up, get him out of there, and keep people in there like Dave Filoni that have a passion right. for it to keep well, it going. Well, I, I will say that when this article came out, he had not responded to the torching that he was getting. He's probably been muzzled by <laughs> Disney. Disney, was, Disney, if nothing else, they're masterminds at marketing right. and public relations. So yeah. they so. probably took this guy's Twitter account away right <laughs> off the bat. I don't know. We'll have to go look and see. I afterwards. mean, he's threatening a multi-billion dollar you know, endeavor here. Yeah. So you don't want this guy <laughs> tweeting back out. Right. So we'll so. see. So I thought that was a, a fun story to just kind of throw in. You just wanted to poke a stick in my cage. Always. Great. <laughs> uh, so we'll come back uh, with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We 
look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. So apparently Greece is the word. Why don't you tell us about I this word? I heard that. So uh, CBS has made an announcement that the sing-along version of the classic 1978 musical will air on June 7th at 8.30, which will actually be replacing what was originally supposed to be the Tony Awards ceremony. Um, They had obviously postponed the awards during... um, everything with the the coronavirus pandemic. So to replace it as part of the Sunday night movie series, Greece will be one of the ones uh, showing. So just like how we talked about last week, the wonderful world of Disney was going to be coming back on Wednesday night. So Wednesday was going to be Disney movie night. Sunday is going to be movie night on CBS. So it'll actually start this Sunday with Mission Impossible. Then on May 24th, they'll be showing Titanic. And on the 31st, it'll be Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And then obviously June 7th will be the sing-along version of Greece. Um, this is the first time uh, in so many years, obviously, that the... Um, Networks? <laughs> yeah, that the the award the Tony Awards oh. are being postponed. Obviously, I had a, a brain fart. Sorry about that. Um, because obviously everything that's going on, and as of right now, as we mentioned earlier, it looks like you know Broadway isn't opening back up until the sixth, you know, of, of September at, at this point anyway. Um, so there's. Um, no word as to when, obviously, the Tony Awards would even be showing uh, or would be uh, having their awards, whether or not they're going to show them live or, or not. What's there to have awards for? <laughs> exactly. You know? nothing. Nothing's open right now. So here's another you know, example of we don't have anything new in... The pipeline, so we're gonna show you know some some older movies. And you know, you know? it's it's kind of cool that you know we knew mm-hmm. we've been talking for weeks now that right that it was gonna your happen. reality TV and your scripted TV aren't in production. So you're mm-hmm. not gonna have anything for them to recycle you know existing material like mm-hmm. this, but do it in a way that kind of brings back that traditional mm-hmm. family television mm-hmm. programming. I think it's kind of cool. It's a nice. It's one of the positives, I think, that comes out of this whole thing. Right, you right. Know, the fact that these companies, I mean, obviously they're desperate for right, viewership. Right, right, right. But the fact that they're they're bringing it back in a, in a way that at least you and I remember right. as kids right. from these these. And that's the thing is it, it was funny because I saw a, a video clip of something and it was a YouTube video and it was the original like CBS Sunday Night at the Movies little intro and – it just jarred my memory. I remembered, you know, not necessarily watching any of the movies because I was probably too young, you know, to stay up. But just seeing that sparked something like, wait, I, I remember my parents probably yeah. watching that. Well, so, and the one thing that I remember as a kid was Sundays, they would have Matinee the Bijou on, uh, Was Channel 12 was PBS down here. Mm-hmm. And they'd show old movies from like the 30s and 40s. Mm. And my dad would always watch those. And that was one of the few times I actually got to sit down and watch a movie with my dad. Mm -hmm. You know, watching some of the old um, uh, Bob Hope movies. Okay. And, and, you know, it's where I saw Casablanca for the first time. Oh, wow. Okay. Like that was that was a tradition that I would mm-hmm. I would share with my dad. It mm-hmm. was one of the few that I hadn't had the opportunity. And to. and I think you know through all this you you've definitely seen a lot 
at least with us, I'm sure in, in some situations, maybe, you know, it's not such a positive, but we're, we're spending more family quality time together. We're, you know, we're, we're doing movie nights, we're doing game nights, other families, you know, that would be running around doing this sport or this activity or, or this, they're finally sitting down and having dinner together as a family. And, you know, here's an opportunity. Hey, you know what? We have Grease on DVD, but it's on. It's the sing-along version. Let's all watch it together. Or Indiana Jones. At least it's not Temple of Doom or Crystal Skull. <laughs> they picked a good one. They, picked a, they probably picked the one with you know the least amount of, yeah. you know. And it's a family one. You, right. you got his dad. So it's a good, you know, family photo, uh, family photo, family movie to, to watch. So I, I could see... You know, hopefully this brings us back to, you know, enjoying the time with the, sure. the family. So less, less digital time and, and more family interaction, mm -hmm. even if you're doing it digitally on the rock band. <laughs> right. That's okay. So tell us about Hamilton. So I was very excited when I first heard the news, um, that they were going to be, um, Disney Plus had gotten the permission to run Hamilton, which was actually the stage performance. Um, they actually filmed this back in June of 2016 with the original cast. All the original cast was in it. But the original plan was actually to release it on October 15th of 2021. Well powers that be decided to move it up so now it's actually going to be coming out on july 3rd making it available to watch over the july 4th weekend wow. <laughs> that is timing um so again it's the original broadway cast um when i had first heard that they were producing this i thought it was going to be a film adaptation just like they did Phantom of the Opera and Les Mis, that it was, you know, a film version with the original Broadway cast, but it's not. It's actually just a film recording of them performing it on, on Broadway. Um, but they're adding, you know, a little bit to it. So it's, you know, the live theater, film and streaming, kind of, you know, a new way to experience the, the Tony Award winning musical. Um, if you follow... Uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, he's been releasing various broad, uh, Broadway mu musicals uh, on YouTube. On He has a YouTube channel. So he had, um, I think Cats is supposed to be this weekend. Uh, a couple weeks ago, it was Phantom of the Opera. So, and they're th the theatrical versions of it. With Broadway being shut down... Obviously, this is giving people an opportunity who either don't live near New York or don't have the ability to, to see a live production to actually see something from well, the comfort of like, their own home. You know, with Broadway shut down, even if you are close, you can't see it. Right. But I think this opens up the audience to a much oh, wider abs audience. Absolutely. And, and kind of sparks that desire because people, you know, you don't know what a Broadway show is until you go see a Broadway right, show. Right. You know, everyone has this preconceived notion of what a stage mm -hmm. show is. Right. And it's not compelling enough for people to, to drive an hour, two hours to go up and see one or even see something like that at your local theater. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so hopefully something like this where you right. can see it in the comfort of your own home will spark that desire and, and, and start and, that passion. And that's what I, I hope with Andrew Lloyd Webber showing his various different things. I think Broadway.com is also showing, if not the whole production of something, short clips of something to try and sure. get those people who, like you said, wouldn't normally go to a live performance to see, wow, this would kind of be cool to, to, to go and see. And obviously... If you don't know, Hamilton is, you know, still selling out, still hard to get. You know, I don't know if it's as hard to get tickets for as it was, you know, when it first opened. 
but there are so many people that know all the songs, know all the stories, and just haven't had a chance to to see it. And this is such a wonderful opportunity to not only see it, but see it with the original cast. So if you have an album of it, you know, a recording of it, you probably have the original cast recording. And it's always cool to still see it with the original cast. So it's awesome that they were able to record it and even better that it's going to be, you know, coming out in, in just a couple of months, um, you know, streaming on Disney plus. So. And that was all we had for our entertainment news this week. Mm -hmm. We will be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my, it, it's funny, when we watched this, we were both like, it's my insightful pick. No, it's mine. We actually fought over this one. Um, it's a new show that is streaming on Disney+, Plus, and it is called Prop Culture. Um, so the host revisits classic Disney titles and looks at them through the lenses of how props help to shape and create their most magical moments. Now, we've only watched the first episode, which was Mary Poppins based. And we were just such in such awe of it. Um, so not only does he, you know, have a couple of pieces of, of props, but they end up, he almost goes on a scavenger hunt to find various pieces, you know, from, from the movies. So I'm very interested to, to, watch more to see how it kind of evolves. The other thing too was, you know, to, to kind of bounce off. He's such a fan. He's, you know, he admits that he's a fanboy of movies and, and the nostalgia behind it and gives you such a history lesson behind things. Um, and, you know, just digging through things and, and giving backstories of, you know, how they found, you know, various items. So the first episode, which is the only one that we've watched so far, uh, was Mary Poppins. And it was just kind of neat because the whole premise behind it was he was trying to find the umbrella and the, the original umbrella because he explained that back then when they did movies, when the movie was over... Props either got thrown out or they got repurposed, remade into to other things. You know, they weren't as protected as, you know, they are now in, in a lot of cases. So his hunt kind of started with that and led him to, you know, to go to the archives. And when they went to the archives, they had um, the horses from... The, the one seen the merry-go-round horses and these were the original horses and the one horse Disney had in their possession from you know when the movie was was finished the other one you could see had been worn and worn down they had lost it at some point but managed to get it back same thing as you're going through Mary Poppins carpet bag you know the interesting story was that there was only one made and that years ago they had done a contest and the first prize was, I think, what was it, $10,000 and the carpet bag. And when the person from the, the marketing company went to go deliver the prize, the person was like, well, I just want the money. And he didn't want the bag. And the marketing person just kept the bag and it was in his attic ever since. And I guess so many years ago... You know, they were cleaning out his attic. They found it, and through various channels, Disney managed to get it back. So it's back in the possession, you know, of Disney. So that part of it was just so well done. Um, I know um, one of the the future episodes is going to be Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and what's very cool about that is that it's the first interview that Rick Moranis has done in 20 something years. So just to see him talking about the movie, I I'm getting choked up already because I remember seeing that movie as a kid and always thinking of him as, you know, like, wouldn't it be cool if he was my dad? And obviously we know he, you know, he stepped back, you know, from acting and everything. So it's kind of cool that 
he kind of came back, you know, for this episode. Um, so some of the other movies um, that they talk about, so Mary Poppins being one, Tron, uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, The Chronicles of Narnia, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and The Muppet Movie. Um, the other thing is that they do have some of the original cast in in each of them. Uh, so what was cool was the the girl, <laughs> the young woman, <laughs> or, or the woman that played young Jane. She, you know, makes appearance in this episode. And what was kind of cool was she still had her original hat from the movie and and he was able to find her original coat. So it was kind of cool reuniting the costume, you know, together. So I know you were, you know, very interested in it. So it, it was definitely a, a good find, you know, for, for both of us. So. Definitely. Good pick. So my pick this week is not a documentary. <gasps> Uh, it is streaming on Amazon Prime, and it is Tales from the Loop. Uh, the townspeople who live above the loop, in quotes, a machine built to unlock and explore the mysteries of the universe, experience things previously consigned to the realm of science fiction. Based on the work of Swedish artist Simon Stalenhag, Famous for his scenes of pastoral t tranquility draped around uncanny sci-fi sites, this Amazon Prime original drama is a collection of eight stories where everyday life competes with the supernatural. Um, it's kind of a cross between Stranger Things, Twilight Zone, and Eureka. And those are three of my probably favorite shows, yeah. you know, together, um, so... There's a recurring cast, there's some overlap, overlapping uh, plots, uh, and they all explore life in this Ohio neighborhood built above the loop, which is kind of, the way they've depicted it so far, it's kind of like uh, the Large Hadron Collider. Okay. Okay, where they're finding particles and stuff like that through science, um, and it's designed to explore the mysteries of the universe. And, you know, in the first episode, they reveal what this unknown material is. And this unknown material has strange properties with physics and time okay. and stuff like that. Um, it's a darker version of Eureka. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't the same comedy there, but the concept of having this, this town that is a science-based town where with um advancements and stuff like that because it's it's you can't place it in time because if you look at like the costumes you didn't really see vehicles i only seen the first episode but like the costumes kind of feel like a 1950s 1960s sort of okay vibe to it but they've got modern semi-modern computers like computers from like the late 80s 90s mm -hmm. so you kind of don't know where kinda this Kind of like is. with Gotham where, like, they have flip phones, yes. but yet, you know, the cars, the cars look are old. Yeah. 1970s, so. Yeah, so it's, and, and I think this first episode, they, they kind of had to do that to support the underlying plot that was mm -hmm. sort of a time-based plot. Okay. Um, but the show has a lot of potential. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the other seven episodes, but I didn't want to start watching it until you saw the first right, one. Right, right. Because if you're interested in watching yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It definitely we'll sounds like it, something I'll... Uh, we'll put it on our watch list and we'll... We have so many things we have to go and, uh, watch. We, we have a lot to catch <laughs> up on. So Tales from the Loop is streaming now on Amazon Prime. Good pick. So that was all we had today. Mm -hmm. um, I would invite folks to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> um, if you want to reach out to us directly, you can catch us on Twitch. Uh, we stream six days a week 
at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Or you can email us at comments at insights into things.com. We are on the Twitterverse at insights underscore things. And we don't troll, just, no, just saying. Uh, or you could watch us on YouTube at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Or you can get all of our material on the web at insights into things.com. Or if you just want the audio version, you can go to podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And if you want to support the evil empire, you can catch us on Facebook at <laughs> facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. And I think that's it. I think that's it. Another one in the books. Stay safe, everyone.